Act Three of Love for Love by William Congreve. Act Three, Scene One Nurse Alone. Miss, Miss, Miss Prue, mercy on me, marry and amen. Why, what's become of the child? Why, Miss, Miss Forsythe. Sure, she has locked herself up in the chamber and gone to sleep or to prayers. Miss, Miss, I hear her. Come to your father, child. Open the door. Open the door, Miss. I hear you cry, hushed. Oh, Lord, who's there? Peeps. What's here to do? Oh, the father, a man with her. Why, Miss, I say, God's my life. Here's fine doings towards, oh, Lord. We're all undone. Oh, you young hollow tree. Knox. Odds my life won't you open the door? I'll come in the back way. Scene two. Tattle Miss Prue. Oh, Lord, she's coming. And she'll tell my father. What shall I do now? Pox take her. If she had stayed two minutes longer, I should have wished her coming. Oh dear, what shall I say? Tell me, Mr. Tattle, tell me a lie. There's no occasion for a lie. I could never tell a lie to no purpose. But since we have done nothing, we must say nothing, I think. I hear her. I'll leave you together and come off as you can. Thrusts her in and shuts the door. Scene 3. Tattle, Valentine, Scandal, Angelica. You can't accuse me of inconstancy. I never told you that I loved you. But I can accuse you of uncertainty for not telling me whether you did or not. You mistake indifference for uncertainty. I never had concern enough to ask myself the question. Nor good nature enough to answer him that did ask you. I'll say that for you, madam. What? Are you setting up for good nature? Only for the affectation of it, as the women do for ill nature. Persuade your friend that it is all affectation. I shall receive no benefit from the opinion, for I know no effectual difference between continued affectation and reality. Tattle, coming up. Aside to scandal. Scandal, are you in private discourse? Anything of secrecy? Yes, but I dare trust you. We were talking of Angelica's love to Valentine. You won't speak of it. No, no, not a syllable. I know that's a secret, or it's whispered everywhere. Ha ha ha! What is, Mr. Kettle? I heard you say something was whispered everywhere. Your love a Valentine. How? No, madam, his love for your ladyship. God take me. I beg your pardon, for I never heard a word of your ladyship's passion till this instant. My passion? And who told you of my passion, pray, sir? Why? Is the devil in you? Did not I tell it you for a secret? Yes, so. But I thought she might have been trusted with her own affairs. Is that your discretion? Trust a woman with herself? You say true, I beg your pardon. I'll bring all off. It was impossible, madam, for me to imagine that a person of your ladyship's wit and gallantry could have so long received the passionate addresses of the accomplished Valentine and yet remain insensible. Therefore, you will pardon me if from a just weight of his merit, with your ladyship's good judgment, I form the balance of a reciprocal affection. Oh, the devil! What a damned costive poet has given thee this lesson of fashion to get to my route! I dare swear you wrong him. It is his own. 
and Mr. Tattle only judges of the success of others from the effects of his own merit. For certainly Mr. Tattle was never denied anything in his life. Oh, Lord, yes indeed, madam, several times. I swear, I don't think tis possible. Yes, I vow and swear I have. Lord, madam, I'm the most unfortunate man in the world, and the most cruelly used by the ladies. Ah, oh, nay, now you're ungrateful. No, I hope not. Tis as much ingratitude to own some favours as to conceal others. There, now it's out. I don't understand you now. I thought you had never asked anything but what a lady might modestly grant, and you confess. But so, Faith, your business is done here. Now you may go brag somewhere else. Brag? Oh, heavens. Why, did I name anybody? No, I suppose that is not in your power. But you would, if you could, no doubt on it. Not in my power, madam. What does your ladyship mean that I have no woman's reputation in my power? Scandal aside. Oons, why you won't own it, will you? Faith, madam, you're in the right. No more I have as I hope to be saved. I never had it in my power to say anything to a lady's prejudice in my life. For as I was telling you, madam, I have been the most unsuccessful creature living in things of that nature, and never had the good fortune to be trusted once with a lady's secret, not once. No. Not once, I dare answer for him. And I'll answer for him, for I'm sure if he had, he would have told me. I find, madam, you don't know Mr. Tattle. No, indeed, madam, you don't know me at all, I find. For sure my intimate friends would have known. Then it seems you would have told if you had been trusted. Oh, pox scandal. That was too far put. Never have told particulars, madam. Perhaps I might have talked as of a third person, or have introduced an amour of my own in conversation by way of novel, but never have explained particulars. But whence comes the reputation of Mr. Teddle's secrecy if he was never trusted? Why, then it advises, the thing is proverbially spoken, but may be applied to him, as if we should say in general terms, he only is secret who never was trusted, a satirical proverb upon our sex. There's another upon yours, as she is chaste who has never asked the question, that's all. A couple of very civil proverbs, truly. Tis hard to tell whether the lady or Mr. Tattle be the more obliged to do you, for you found her virtue upon the backwardness of the men, and his secrecy upon the mistrust of the women. Gad, it's very true, madam. I think we are obliged to acquit ourselves. And for my part, but your ladyship is to speak first. Am I? Well, I freely confess I have resisted a great deal of temptation. And egad, I have given some temptation that has not been resisted. Good. I cite Valentine here to declare to the court how fruitless he has found his endeavours, and to confess all his solicitations and my denials. I am ready to plead not guilty for you, and guilty for myself. So, why this is fair, here's demonstration with a witness. Well, my witnesses are not present, but I confess I have had favours from persons, 
But as the favors are numberless, so the persons are nameless. <laughs> this boost not. No, I can show letters, lockets, pictures, and rings. And if there be occasion for witnesses, I can summon the maids at the chocolate houses, all the porters at Pall Mall and Covent Garden, the doorkeepers at the playhouse, the drawers at Lockett's, Pontax, the Rama Spring Garden, my own landlady and valet de chambre, all who shall make oath that I receive more letters than the secretary's office and that I have more visor masks to inquire for me than ever went to the hermaphrodite or the naked prince. And it is notorious that, in a country church once, an inquiry being made who I was, it was answered I was the famous Tattle who had ruined so many women. It was there, I suppose, you got the nickname of the Great Turk. True, I was called Turk Tattle all over the parish. The next Sunday, all the old women kept their daughters at home, and the parson had not half his congregation. He would have brought me into the spiritual court, but I was revenged upon him, for he had a handsome daughter whom I initiated into the science. But I repented it afterwards, for it was talked of in town. And the lady of quality, that shall be nameless, in a raging fit of jealousy, came down in her coach and six horses, and exposed herself upon my account. Gad, I was sorry for it with all my heart. You know whom I mean. You know where we raffled. Ma'am, huh. So death, are not you ashamed? Oh, barbarous! I never heard so insolent a piece of vanity. Fie, Mr. Tattle! I'll swear I could not have believed it. Is this your secrecy? Gad, so the heat of my story carried me beyond my discretion, as the heat of the lady's passion hurried her beyond her reputation. But I hope you don't know whom I mean, for there was a great many ladies raffled. Pox on it! Now could I bite off my tongue? No, don't, for then you'll tell us no more. Come, I'll recommend a song to you, upon the hint of my two proverbs, and I see one in the next room that will sing it. Goes to the door. For oh, heaven's sake, if you do guess, say nothing. God, I'm very unfortunate. Pray sing the first song in the last new play. Song, set by Mr. John Eccles. A nymphondal swain to Apollo once prayed. The swain had been jilted, the nymph been betrayed. Their intent was to try if his oracle knew, ere a nymph that was chaste, or a swain that was true. Apollo was mute, and had liked to have been posed, but sagely at length he this secret disclosed. He alone won't betray, in whom none will confide, and the nymph may be chaste that has never been tried. Scene 4. To them, Sir Sumpson, Mrs. Frail, Miss Prue, and Servant. Is Ben come? Odd so, my son Ben come? Odd, I'm glad on't. Where is he? I long to see him. Now, Mrs. Frail, you shall see my son Ben. Body o' me, he's the hopes of the family. I haven't seen him these three years. I warrant he's grown. Call him in. Bid him make haste. I'm ready to cry for joy. Now, miss, you shall see your husband. Miss Prue, aside to Mrs. Frail. Pish, he shall be none of my husband. Hush, well, he shan't. Leave that to me. I'll beckon Mr. Tattle to us. Won't you stay and see your brother? 
We are the twin stars and cannot shine in one sphere. When he rises, I must set. Besides, if I should stay, I don't know, but my father in good nature may press me to the immediate signing the deed of conveyance of my estate, and I'll defer it as long as I can. Well, you'll come to a resolution. I can't. Resolution must come to me, or I shall never have one. Come, Valentine, I'll go with you. I have something in my head to communicate to you. Scene 5. Angelica, Sir Sampson, Tattle, Mrs. Fro, Miss Prue. What? Is my son Valentine gone? What? Is he sneaked off and would not see his brother? There's an unnatural whelp. There's an ill-natured dog. What were you here to, madam, and could not keep him? Could neither love, nor duty, nor natural affection oblige him? Odds bud, madam, have no more to say to him. He is not worth your consideration. The rogue has not a dram of generous love about him. All interest, all interest. He is an undone scoundrel, and courts your estate, body of me. He does not care a doit for your person. I am pretty even with him, Sir Samson. For if ever I could have liked anything in him, it should have been his estate too. But since that's gone, the bait's off, and the naked hook appears. Odds but well spoken, and you're a wiser woman than I thought you were. For most young women nowadays are to be tempted with a naked hook. If I marry Sir Samson, I'm for a good estate with any man, and for any man with a good estate. Therefore, if I were obliged to make a choice, I declare I'd rather have you than your son. Faith and troth, you're a wise woman. I'm glad to hear you say so. I was afraid you were in love with the reprobate. Odd, I was sorry for you with all my heart. Hang him, mongrel, cast him off. You shall see the rogue show himself and make love to some desponding cadua of fourscore for sustenance. Odd, I love to see a young spendrith forced to cling to an old woman for support, like ivy round a dead oak. Faith I do. I love to see him hug and cotton together, like down upon a thistle. Scene six. To them, Ben Legend and Servant. Where's father? There, sir. His back's for you. My son, Ben. Bless thee, my dear boy. Body of me, thou art heartily welcome. Thank you, father, and I'm glad to see you. Oddspot, and I was glad to see thee. Kiss me, boy. Kiss me again and again. Dear Ben. Kisses him. So, so, enough, father. Mess, I'd rather kiss these gentlewomen. And so thou shalt, Mrs. Angelica, my son, Ben. Forsooth, if you please. Salutes her. Nay, mistress, I'm not for dropping anchor here. About ship, you say. Kisses frail. Nay, and you too, my little cockboat. So? Kisses Miss Prue. Sir, you're welcome ashore. Thank you, thank you, friend. There has been many a weary league, Ben, since I saw thee. Aye, aye, been. Been far enough, and that's the all. Well, father, and how do all at home? How does brother Dick and brother Val? Dick, body of me. Dick has been dead these two years. I writ you word when you were at Leghorn. Mess, that's true. Mary, I had forgot. Dick's dead, as you say. Well, and how? I have many questions to ask you. Well, you've been married again, father, be you? No, I intend you shall marry, Ben. I would not marry for thy sake. Nay, what does that signify? And you marry again? Why, then I'll go to sea again, so there's one for t'other, and that'll be all. Pray don't let me be your hindrance. In merry God's name, and the wind sit that way. It's for my part, mayhap I have no mind to marry. That would be pity. Such a handsome young gentleman. Handsome? <laughs> Nay, for sooth, then you be for joking. I'll joke with you, for I love my jest. And the ship was sinking as we sailed at sea. But I'll tell you I don't much stand towards matrimony. I love to roam about from port to port and from land to land. I could never abide to be port-bound, as we call it. 
Now, a man that is married has, as it were, do you see, his feet in the bilbos. Mayhap may to get them out again when he would. Ben's a wag. A man that is married, do you see, is no more like another man than a galley slave is like one of us free sailors. He is chained to an oar all his life, and they have forced to tug a leaky vessel into the bargain. A very wag. Ben's a very wag. Only a little rough. He wants a little polishing. Not at all. I like his humour mightily. It's plain and honest. I should like such a humour in a husband extremely. Saying you so, forsooth. Mary, and I should like such a handsome gentlewoman for a bedfellow hugely. How say you, mistress, would you like going to sea? Yes, you're a tight vessel, and well rigged, and you are but as well manned. I should not doubt that if you were master of me. But I'll tell you one thing, and you come to sea in a high wind or that lady, you mayn't carry so much sailor you had, top and top gallant by the mess. No, why so? Why, and you do, you may run the risk to be over such, and then you'll carry your keels above water. <laughs> I swear, Mr. Benjamin is the veriest wag in nature, an absolute sea wit. Nay, Ben has parts, but as I told you before, they want a little polishing. You must not take anything ill, madam. Oh, I hope the gentleman is not angry. I mean all in good heart. For if I give a jest, I'll take a jest, and so forsooth you may be as free with me. I thank you, sir. I am not at all offended. But methinks, Sir Samson, you should leave him alone with his mistress. Mr. Tattle, we must not hinder lovers. Tattle, aside to Miss Prue. Well, miss, I have your promise. Body o' me, madam, you say true. Look you, Ben, this is your mistress. Come, miss, you must not be shamefaced. We'll leave you together. I can't abide to be left alone. Mayn't my cousin stay with me? No, no, come, let's away. Look you, father, mayhap the young woman may take a liking to me. I'll warrant thee, boy. Come, come, we'll be gone. I'll venture that. Scene seven, Ben and Miss Crew. Come, mistress, will you please to sit down? For when you stand a sterner than, we shall never grapple together. Come, I'll hold a chair. There, and you please to sit. I'll sit by you. You need not sit so near one. If you have something to say, I can hear you farther off. I ain't deaf. Why, that's true, as you say, nor I ain't dumb. I can be heard as far as another. I'll heave off to please you. Sit farther off. And we were a league asunder, I'd undertake to hold discourse with you, and twere not a main high wind indeed, and full in my teeth. Look you, forsooth, I am, as it were, bound for the land of matrimony. It is a voyage, do you see, that was none of my seeking. I was commanded by father, and if you like of it, mayhap I may steer into your harbour. How say you, mister? The short of the thing is that if you like me, and I like you, we may chance to swing in a hammock together. I don't know what to say to you, nor I don't care to speak with you at all. No? I'm sorry for that. But pray, why are you so scornful? As long as one must not speak one's mind, one had better not speak at all, I think. And truly, I won't tell a lie for the matter. Nay, you say true in that. It's but a folly to lie. For to speak one thing and to think just the contrary ways, as it were, to look one way and to row another. Now, for my part, you see, I'm for carrying things above board. I'm not for keeping anything under hatches. That if you be as willing as I, say so in God's name, there's no harm done. They help you may be shamefaced. The maidens stop, they love a man well enough. But they don't care to tend to his face. If that's the case, why, silence gives consent. But I'm sure it is not so, for I'll speak sooner than you should believe that. And I'll speak truth, though one should always tell a lie to a man. And I don't care, let my father do what he will. I'm too big to be whipped, so I'll tell you plainly. I don't like you, nor love you at all, nor never will. 
That's more, so there's your answer for you. And don't trouble me no more, you ugly thing. Look you, young woman, you may learn to give good words, however. I spoke you fair, do you see, and civil. As your love or your liking, I don't value it of a rogue's end. And I have I like you as little as you do me. What I said was in obedience to father. Had I fear a whipping no more than you do. But I tell you one thing, if you should give such language at sea, you'd have a cat of nine tears laid across your shoulders. Flesh, who are you? You heard the other handsome young woman speak civilly to me of her own accord. Whichever you think of yourself, cat, I don't think you are any more to compare to her than a can of small beer to a bowl of punch. Well, and there's a handsome gentleman, and a fine gentleman, and a sweet gentleman that was here, that loves me, and I love him. And if he sees you speak to me anymore, he'll thrash your jacket for you, he will, you great sea calf. What? You mean that fair weather spark that was just here now? Will he thrash my jacket? Latin, Latin. <laughs> But if he comes near me, mayhap I may give him a salty of supper. All that. What does father mean to leave me alone as soon as I come home with such a dirty, dowdy sea calf? I ain't calf enough to lick your chopped face, you cheese curd, you. Marry me? <laughs> Own thou marry a Lapland witches soon and live upon selling contrary winds and wet vessels. I won't be called names. Nor I won't be abused thus, so I won't. If I were a man... Cries. You durst not talk at his rate. No, you durst not, you stinking tar barrel. Scene 8. To them, Mrs. Forsyth and Mrs. Frail. They have quarreled, just as we could wish. Tar barrel. <laughs> Let your sweetheart there call me so if you'll take your part, your tom lessons, and I'll say something to him. Get our laces musk doublet for him. I'll make him stink. He shall smell more like a weasel than a civet cat before I had done with him. Bless me. What's the matter, miss? What does she cry? Mr. Benjamin, what have you done to her? Let her cry. The more she cries, the less she'll... Well, she's been gathering foul weather in her mouth and it rains out her eyes. Come, miss. Come along with me and tell me, poor child. Lord, what shall we do? There's my brother Forsyth and Sir Samson coming. Sister, do you take Miss down into the parlour, and I'll carry Mr. Benjamin into my chamber, for they must not know that they are fallen out. Come, sir, will you venture yourself with me? Looking kindly on him. Venture, Miss, and that I will, but we're to see in a storm. Scene 9. Sir Sampson and Forsyth. I left them together here. What? Are they gone? Ben's a brisk boy. He's got her into a corner. Father's own son, Faith. He'll tousle her and mousle her. The rogue's sharp set, coming from sea. If he should not stay for saving grace, old foresight, but to fall without the help of a parson. Ha! Odd. If he should, I could not be angry with him. T'would be but like me, a chip of the old block. Ha! Thou art melancholic. Old pronostication, as melancholic as if thou had spilt the salt or pared thy nails on a Sunday. Come, cheer up, look about thee, look up, old stargazer. Now, is he pouring upon the ground for a crooked pin or an old horse nail with a head towards him? Sir Samson, we'll have the wedding tomorrow morning. With all my heart. At ten o'clock, punctually at ten. To a minute, to a second, thou shalt set thy watch, and the bridegroom shall observe its motions. They shall be married to a minute, go to bed to a minute, and when the alarm strikes, they shall keep time like the figures of St Dunstan's clock, and consummatum est shall ring all over the parish. Scene 10, to them, scandal. Uh, Sir Sam's sad news. Bless us. Why, what's the matter? Can't you guess at what ought to afflict you and him and all of us more than anything else? Body of me, 
I don't know any universal grievance but a new tax or the loss of the Canary Fleet, unless Popery should be landed in the West or the French fleet were at anchor at Blackwall. No, undoubtedly Mr Forsyth knew all this and might have prevented it. There's no earthquake. No, not yet, nor whirlwind. But we don't know what it may come to, but it has had a consequence already that touches us all. Why, body of me, out with... Something has appeared to your son Valentine. He's gone to bed, a pont, and very ill. He speaks little, but he says he has a world to say. Asks for his father and the wise foresight. Talks of Raymond Lully and the ghost of Lily. He has secrets to impart, I suppose, to you too. I can get nothing out of him but sighs. He desires he may see you in the morning, but would not be disturbed tonight because he has some business to do in a dream. Hoity toity, what have I to do with his dreams or his divination? Body of me. This is a trick to defer signing the conveyance. I warrant the devil will tell him in a dream that he must not part with his estate. But I'll bring him a parson to tell him that the devil's a liar. Or if that won't do, I'll bring a lawyer that shall outlie the devil. And so I'll try whether my blackguard or his shall get the better of the day. Scene 11. Scandal Foresight. Alas, Mr Foresight, I'm afraid, all is not right. You are a wise man and a conscientious man, a searcher for obscurity and futurity, and if you commit an error, it is with a great deal of consideration and discretion and caution. Ah, oh, good Mr. Scandal. Nay, nay, it is manifest. I do not flatter you. But uh, Sir Samson is hasty, very hasty. I'm afraid he is not scrupulous enough, Mr. Forsyth. He has been wicked, and heaven grant he may mean well in this affair with you. But my mind gives me these things cannot be wholly insignificant. You are wise. You should not be overreached. Methinks you should not. Alas, Mr. Scandal. Humanum esterare. You say true. Man will err. Mere man will err. But you are something more. There have been wise men, but they were such as you. Men who consulted the stars and were observers of omens. Solomon was wise, but how? By his judgment in astrology. So says. Pineda in his third book and eighth chapter. You are learned, Mr. Scandal. A trifler, but a lover of art. And the wise men of the East owed their instructions to a star, which is rightly observed by Gregory the Great in favour of astrology. And Alberatus Magnus makes the most valuable science because says he, it teaches us to consider the causation of causes and the causes of things. I protest, I honour you, Mr. Scandal. I did not think you had been read in these matters. You young men are inclined. I thank my stars that have inclined me, but I fear this marriage and making over this estate this transferring of a rightful inheritance will bring judgments upon us. I prophesy it, and I would not have the fate of Cassandra not to be believed. Valentine is disturbed. What can be the cause of that? And Sir Samson is hurried on by an unusual violence. I fear he does not act wholly from himself. Methinks he does not look as he used to do. He was always of an impetuous nature. But as to this marriage, I have consulted the stars, and all appearances are prosperous. Come, come, Mr. Forsyth, let not the prospect of worldly lucre carry you beyond your judgment, nor against your conscience. You are not satisfied that you act justly. How? You are not satisfied, I say. I am loath to discourage you, 
but it is palpable that you are not satisfied. How does it appear, Mr. Scandal? I think I am very well satisfied. Either you suffer yourself to deceive yourself, or you do not know yourself. Pray, explain yourself. Do you sleep well, O Knights? Very well. Are you certain? You do not luck so. I am in health, I think. So was Valentine this morning, and looked just so. How? Am I altered any way? I don't perceive it. Uh, that may be, but your beard is longer than it was two hours ago. Indeed. Bless me. Scene 12. To them, Mrs. Forsythe. Husband, will you go to bed? It's ten o'clock. Mr. Scandal, your servant. Scandal, aside. Pox on her. She has interrupted my design, but I must work her into the project. You keep early hours, madam? Mr. Forsythe is punctual. We sit up after him. My dear, pray lend me your glass. Your little looking glass. Pray lend it to him, madam. I'll tell you the reason. She gives him the glass. Scandal and she whisper. My passion for you is grown so violent that I'm no longer master of myself. I was interrupted in the morning when you had charity enough to give me your attention. I had hopes of finding another opportunity of explaining myself to you, but was disappointed all this day. The uneasiness that has attended me ever since brings me now hither at this unseasonable hour. Was there ever such impudence to make love to me before my husband's face? I'll swear I'll tell him. Do. I'll die martyr rather than disclaim my passion. But I'll come a little farther this way, and I'll tell you what project I had to get him out of the way, that I might have an opportunity of waiting upon you. Whisper. Foresight looking in the glass. I do not see any revolution here. Methinks I look with a serene and benign aspect. Pale, a little pale. But the roses of these cheeks have been gathered many years. Oh, I do not like that sudden flushing. Gone already. <laughs> Faintish. My heart is pretty good, yet it beats, and my pulses, oh, I have none. Mercy on me. Oh, oh. yes, here they are. Gallop, 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 gallop. Hey, whither will they hurry me? Now they're gone again. And, and now I'm faint again, and pale again, and, and, and my uh, breath uh, grows short. <laughs> it takes. Pursue it in the name of love and pleasure. How do you do, Mr. Forsythe? Um, I'm not so well as I thought I was. Lend me your hand. Look, you there now. Your lady says your sleep has been unquiet of late. Very likely. Oh, mighty restless. But I was afraid to tell him so. He has been subject to talking and starting. And did not used to be so? Never, never till within these three nights. I cannot say that he has once broken my rest since we have been married. I... We'll go to bed. Do so, Mr. Forsythe, and say your prayers. He looks better than he did. Nurse! Nurse! Do you think so, Mr. Scandal? Yes, yes. I hope this will be gone by morning, taking it in time. I hope so. Scene 13. To them, nurse. Nurse, your master is not well. Put him to bed. I hope you'll be able to see Valentine in the morning. 
you had best take a little diacotinine and cowslip water and lie upon your back. Maybe you may dream. I thank you, Mr. Scandal. I will. A nurse, let me have a watch light and lay the crumbs of comfort by me. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, um, um, I'm very faint. No, no, you look much better. Do I? And do you hear? Oh, bring me, let me see. Within a quarter of twelve. Um, uh, um, just upon the turning of the tide, bring me the urinal, and I hope neither the lord of my ascendant nor the moon will be combust, and then I may do well. I hope so. Leave that to me. I will erect a scheme, and I hope I shall find both Sol and Venus in the sixth house. I thank you, Mr. Scandal. Indeed, that would be a great comfort to me. <laughs> Good night. Scene 14. Scandal, Mrs. Forsythe. Good night. Good Mr. Forsythe, and I hope Mars and Venus will be in conjunction while your wife and I are together. Well, and what use do you hope to make of this project? You don't think that you are ever like to succeed in your design upon me? Yes, Faith, I do. I have a better opinion both of you and myself than to despair. Did you ever hear such a toad? Hurt you, Devil. Do you think any woman honest? Yes, several, very honest. They'll cheat a little at cards sometimes, but that's nothing. Shaw, sure, but virtuous, I mean. Yes, Faith. I believe some women are virtuous too, but tis as I believe some men are valiant through fear. For why should a man court danger or a woman shun pleasure? Oh, monstrous. What are conscience and honor? Why, honor is a public enemy and conscience a domestic thief and he that would secure his pleasure must pay a tribute to one and go halves with t'other. As for honour, that you have secured, for you have purchased a perpetual opportunity for pleasure. An opportunity for pleasure? Aye, your husband. A husband is an opportunity for pleasure. So you have taken care of honour, and tis the least I can do to take care of conscience. And so you think we are free for one another? Yes, Faith, I think so. I love to speak my mind. Why then, I'll speak my mind. Now as to this affair between you and me, here you make love to me, while I confess it does not displease me. Your person is well enough, and your understanding is not amiss. I have no great opinion of myself, but I think I'm neither deformed nor fool. But you have a villainous character. You are a libertine in speech, as well as practice. Come, I know what you would say. You think it most dangerous to be seen in conversation with me than to allow some other men the last favour. Your mistake. The liberty I take in talking is purely affected for the service of your sex. He that cries out, stop thief, is often he that has stolen the treasure. I'm a juggler that's act by confederacy, and if you please, we'll put a trick upon the world. Aye, but you are such a universal juggler that I'm afraid you have a great many confederates. Faith, I'm sound. Oh, Pete, I'll swear you're impudent. I'll swear you're handsome. Pish, you tell me so, though you did not think so. I do think so, though I should not tell you so. And now I think we know one another pretty well. Oh, Lord, who is here? Scene 15. To them, Mrs. Frail and Ben. Miss, I love to speak my mind. Father, there is nothing to do with me. Nay, no, I can't say that now. There's something to do with me. But what does that signify? 
It's so big that I've been minded to be steered by him. Tis as though we should strive against wind and tide. Aye, but my dear, we must keep it secret till the estate be settled. For you know, marrying without an estate is like sailing in a ship without ballast. <laughs> oh, that's true. Just so for all the world it is indeed as like as two cable ropes. And though I have a good portion, you know one would not venture all in one bottom. Oh, that's true again. Then the hep one bottom may spring a leak. You have hit it indeed, mess you've nicked the channel. Well, but if you should forsake me after all, you'd break my heart. Break your heart? I'd rather the marigold should break her cable in a storm as well as I love her. Flesh, you don't think I'm false-hearted like a landman. A sailor will be honest, though may happy is never a penny of money in his pocket. Mayhap I may not have so fair a face as a citizen or a courtier, but for all that, I was good blood in my veins and a heart as sound as a biscuit. And will you love me always? Nay, and I love once I'll stick like pitch. I'll tell you that. Come, I'll sing you a song of a sailor. Hold, there's my sister. I'll call her to hear it. Well, I won't go to bed to my husband tonight, because I'll retire to my own chamber and think of what you have said. Well, you'll give me leave to wait upon you to your chamber door and leave you my last instructions. Hold, here's my sister coming towards us. If it won't interrupt you, I'll entertain you with a song. The song was made upon one of our ship crew's wife. Our bosun made the song. Mayhap you may know her, sir. Before she was married, she was called Buxom Joan of Deptford. I have heard of her. Ballad. Soldier and sailor, a tinker and a tailor. At once a doubtful strike, sir, to make a maid a wife, sir. His name was Buxom Joan. But now the time was ended, when she no more intended to lick her lips at men, sir, and all the sheets and they, sir, lie at nights alone. The soldier swore like thunder, he loved him more than plunder, and showed him many a scar, sir, that he had brought from afar, sir, with fighting for the sick. The tailor thought to please her, with offering her his measure. The tinker too of metal, said he could mend a kettle and stop up every leak. But while these three were prating, the sailor slyly waiting, thought if it came about, sir, that they should all fall out, sir, he then might play his part. And just in as he meant, sir, to log heads they went, sir, and then he let fly at her a shot twixt wind and water that won this fair maid's heart. If some of our crew that came to see me are not gone, you shall see that we sailors can dance sometimes as well as other folks. I warn that brings him and they be within hearing. And to seamen. Oh, here they be, and fiddles along with them. Come, my lads, let's have a round, and I'll make one. Dance. We're merry folks, we sailors. We hadn't much to care for. Thus we live at sea, eat biscuit and drink flip, put on a clean shirt once a quarter, come home and lie with our landladies once a year, get rid of a little money, then put off with the next fair wind. How do you like us? Oh, you are the happiest merriest men alive. We're beholden to Mr. Benjamin for this entertainment. I believe it's late. Well, I for Susan, you think so, so you'd best go to bed. For my part, I mean to toss a can and remember my sweetheart before I turn in. Mayhap I may dream of her. Mr. Scandal, you had best go to bed and dream too. Why, Faith, I have a good, lively imagination and can dream as much to the purpose as another, if I set about it. But dreaming is the poor retreat of a lazy, hopeless and imperfect lover. It is the last glimpse of love to worn out sinners and the faint dawning of a bliss to wishing girls and growing boys. 
there's naught but willing waking love that can make blessed the ripened maid and finished man. End of Act 3.